Well, welcome to Impact Thursday Night. My name is James Trevett of Whitestone Christian Ministries, and uh, tonight we're going to be continuing on our discussion of the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And last week I talked about why I got into this. I got into this because I feel that there's a shift in the way that we're going to be into prayer. Prayer is taking on a new power and a new meaning. Uh, that God is out there looking for intercessors right now that will pray His will. That we, we think that, well, God, whatever you do is just going to happen. And this is something I've been talking to God about. Uh, did Daniel have to pray? God said that after 70 years, the, the people of Israel are going to go back. But Daniel felt the need to pray for God's will. And I believe that God is looking for intercessors who will know his will now and pray it onto the earth. And that's going to be a little bit more difficult than we think. Because at the time of the cross, it wasn't really clear to the disciples what God's will was. Peter didn't think it was God's purpose that, that Christ should be crucified. But what we see is that there is a perfect plan. And God has a perfect plan. And I believe that he's going to be using intercessors to pray. He's going to point them to a passage of Scripture. And they're, going to, they're not just going to read it. They're going to speak it and pray it. Into, and I have not understood this clearly. But I know this is certainly the place to discuss it. Because this is the place where the intercessors come. Where the eagles gather. So we started out talking about John chapter 17 because I believe this is a critical prayer for these times. That this is the prayer that Jesus prayed for us. And his prayers are definitely answered. When he prayed that, uh, that Peter's faith would not fail, then Peter's faith will not fail. But he also prayed not just for Peter, but he prayed for the disciples and he prayed for us. So this prayer is crucial, I believe, in these last days to get an understanding of it and what our role is on the earth now. So we've been looking at it, and this is part two. We managed to, or tried to, at least cover the first 12 verses of chapter 17 last week. And this week I'm aiming to cover 13. That's not 13 more verses, that's verse 13. <laughs> So we're going to attempt to get not only the first 12 uh, that we got from last week, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're also going to try to pick up one more verse. How's that for progress? So uh, if we're ready, any questions from last week before we get going? Uh, maybe we can answer them even in this discussion. Well, let's begin. He said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And we talked about last week what it meant to, to glorify the Son. Now, does that mean that he's going to go out and win the Super Bowl or do something great that everybody's going to be applauding him and cheering him on? Is that what he's talking about here? What is he talking about? He's going to the cross. So glorifying doesn't necessarily mean something grand as we see it in the world. But apparently it's something very grand for God. So once again, what's God's will? And are we willing to stand with him and watch and pray his will? That's what he asked him to do. And so it's difficult now with all the things that are going on because we're in the same kind of period where all the people are leaving. The, 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 all of a sudden the persecution's coming upon Christians. All of these things that happened to him are happening in these last days. And this prayer is to prepare us for those last days. He said, I reveal you to those you gave me. And then he goes on to say, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. So this group that he's praying for are disciples. This isn't for everybody. And this is a critical thing that we've got to understand because I believe that we must look at what this prayer is saying and realize who is this prayer for. Is it for you? Or is it not for you? It is. His disciples. But remember, that's a pretty small group at this point. 
There's very few with him at the time when he was taken for crucifixion. Well, maybe, but we're going to have to look at that because that's not what it says yet. We're going to have to read on down before we find out that. What we know is, for instance, the, the people that got the experience of the cloven tongues of fire and so on, was that everybody that just happened to be in Jerusalem? Or was it the people who waited, as he said, until the power came in the upper room? You see, when God says these things, it's really that small group that gets that experience. Now, something may come out of that. As we know, Peter stood up and, and several thousand were saved. But they didn't get the cloven tongues of fire. They didn't get the mighty rushing wind. They got the Holy Spirit. But they didn't get the same experience. There was something different. So what we're seeing here is that this prayer is for this special group. And if you look, it talks about this special group. The special group is ones that, quote, have obeyed his word. You manifested his word to them, and they have obeyed it. It said, they know that everything that you have given me comes from you. So they know, not just believe, they know who Christ is. It says, they accepted them. They accepted the words of Christ. They believed that Christ was sent by God. It says, for them I pray. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. So the question is, is this prayer for you? And how do you know that? It says, the ones that the Lord has given him. Is that you? Well, as it turns out, I've got a pop quiz. So let's find out. How about that? So I made up a quiz so we can find out. And I've made, uh, uh, we've done, of course, uh, uh, multiple choice and some true to false. And we're going to determine, are you guys the ones that God has chosen or not? Did you meet the criterion? Do you believe it or do you not? So you ready? Okay, here we go. First one's a little tough here. What is God's nature? A, God is good. B, God is love. C, God is great. D, all of the above. Did I hear D? Ah, uh, uh, you guys are good. You guys are good. Okay. So there's one of them. It gets tougher. Yeah, afraid so. True, false. Here's the questions. Absolute moral truth exists. Yes, yes, it's true. Is it true? Yes. You realize what you just said. You said that there's no relativism in, in morality. That means if he said, you, if he said that you should not be uh, promiscuous, if he said that homosexuality was wrong, if he said that you're lying, then it doesn't really matter what the society says, the government says, or anything else. You're going to believe that there is an absolute moral truth. It's not relative. Do you believe that? Yes. You know, I, I watched, uh, I guess on the news they showed, what is his name? Uh, Thomas Clapper, I believe is his name, the head of security. And uh, in Congress was three or four days ago when they asked him about, is the government collecting all this information on us? He said no. And so when it came out, they went back to him, and his answer was, well, I, I wasn't sure what to do, because, uh, but I gave the least incorrect answer. Okay, now is, this is a man under oath, I swear to God on the Bible, testifying to Congress. Now. Is that acceptable? Is, is it okay to lie, you know, national security is at risk? So you actually believe that? Okay, one, absolute moral truth exists. The next one, absolute truth is defined by the Bible. That's true also. 
Now, wait a minute now. The Bible does not talk about the fact that we were evolved. And there's a lot of people teaching in our schools that we're evolved. Now, you're telling me that you believe what the Bible says. That it's an absolute. Okay. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Now, what about the fooling around with Mary Magdalene? He lived a sinless life. So you believe that? Yes. Okay. God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules it today. Yes. That's true? Yes. He still, he's in charge. Yes. You guys, you haven't seen the news then, obviously. You still think he's in charge? Yes. Yes. All that is true. All that is true. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Salvation is a gift from God that cannot be earned. Now, wait a minute. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of really good people out there. Well, what about, there's a lot of people out there that may not necessarily completely believe that, that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, but, you know, they think he's a good guy and he, he's, he's a prophet. Uh, there's lots of people who who actually think that they've done a lot of good works out there. Are you telling me that all these great people, if they have not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and been saved, that they are not saved? Boy, this is a tough crowd. How about um, Satan is real? Now, wait a minute. Uh, it's not, are you going to argue with your Baptist church? Do they believe in demons? Have you, they talk about them? Yeah, come on. <laughs> You're a Baptist, not a demon, aren't you? That's right. So you guys believe that? Okay, how about this? A Christian has a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people. Ah, uh, wait a minute. If you're in the military, you know you're forbidden to do that now, right? You saw that. Wait a minute. Are you? Wait a minute. You're trying to tell me that there's an authority higher? Amen. Yes, there is. Because everything will buy. Okay. That means if you're in an Islamic country. Okay. All right. The Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. Yes. Okay. So you're saying that all these things are true. Yes. Okay. Well, let's look at something because I got these things. This is the answers, of course, from the George Barna study of a biblical worldview, which he ran in 95, 2000, and 2005, that he did an assessment of the United States and what they believe. So let's see what they found out. The researcher indicated that 9% of all American adults agreed with, with what you just said. 9%? Yep. 9% of Americans. That's just those specific questions. As best I'm sure they understood them. They didn't have me even giving them goading them at it. And they, but only 9% believe that. It goes on, though. Those who are born again did better. 19%. One, these are people who describe themselves as not saved, but born again. One out of five actually said, yep, I believe that. You see the problem here? It says in the last days, many are going to depart from the faith. I'm telling you, remember the, the rule of the many and the few, right? That's right. Usually in general, when it says many and few, which one do you want to be? The few, because glory goes to the few. It goes on. This one is really scary. Less than one half of 1% of adults between 18 and 23 pass this. Whoa. So apparently, whatever's being taught them 
in our school system and other places is not enough for them to believe this truth. They're coming out as youth with not a belief in this. And you're wondering, wait a minute. Do you see what the problem is here? It says um, it's one out of nine for older adults. So you can see the problem. You are a minority, even in Christianity. Remember what it said? They've, they've accepted my words. They believe my words are true. They, the, you remember what he just said? Okay. So who's this for? This prayer isn't for everybody. You're getting it. There's not that many. There's just a few here tonight. I mean, who knows where they are? But most of them wouldn't pass this test, even the ones who claim to be Christians. If you look at more specifically, the moral truth question, yep, 34% believe. Luckily, Christians are up to 46%. Wasn't that great? We're not even half of born-again believers believe that there's a, a moral standard that's unchanging. Half of adults believe the Bible is accurate. Luckily, the Christians are up to 79%. What do the other 20% believe? About a quarter believe that Satan is real. Christians, 40%. Only 40% of those who claim to be Christians. So you can see the problem here. Only half seem to believe that you can't earn your salvation. But of course, that's a surprise. There's a lot of them out there more than that trying to earn it. So you see the problem here. When this, we look at this prayer, it's for a specific group of people. He said, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for this group right here. And so therefore, whatever he's praying is for you. And it's very important to know what he just is praying about. And we're going to understand that. He says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. See, the problem is a lot of glory hasn't come to him through a lot of the others. This is a specific group of people. Romans 8.28, we all quote it. That's for everybody, right? Yeah, that's, well, wait a minute. I thought just all things work together for good, for everyone. And are according to his purpose. So you see, once again, there's qualifiers on these things. It says, because those whom God foreknew, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that his Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now you see why this prayer is important. Because what Jesus was saying is, Father, as we're going to read on, I have this relationship with you, but I'm leaving, and here is what I'm praying. For this group of people, they're going to have exactly what I had. Remember it says, the only the ones the Father has given me? So you wonder about this. You wonder if the disciples themselves just happened to be hanging around the Sea of Galilee and randomly got picked by Jesus. For all we know, those people could have been destined to be alive and just be there at the Sea of Galilee during that time. We don't know that. The one thing we do know, now I believe, is that each one of you is chosen. Not just called, but chosen. Are we predestined? Yes. I believe that. If that's true, that's where we transcend believing. We talked about that last week, right? The difference between believing and knowing? Yep, I believe God is real. That's not the same thing as I know God is real. So this group, I believe, is that chosen, and you will not depart from God. 
It's just not going to happen. And we'll find out in the prayer that he prays that it will not happen. Now, when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, a lot of them took off. But his chosen did not. They stayed, every one of them. He didn't lose a one, he says. So there's going to be a huge departing. But you're not going to be the ones that are departing. But you need to know what he prayed. Because the time is coming very similar to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the one thing you don't want to do is find yourself at odds in your prayers with what the purpose of God is. Because in those days, what would, I mean, says, pray with me, the Lord said. You wonder, what do you pray for? You say that the, that the Romans aren't going to come and take him away? I mean, what do you pray for in that time? What are you going to pray for in these last days when it is written? So you're going to pray his purposes. You know, Moses actually held discussions with him. Moses actually interceded for the people with God. But he was in that special place of knowing his ways and knowing him. So I believe that there's a new kind of prayer that's coming in these last days. And you better not find yourself in cross purposes, trying to defeat the will of God as Peter tried to. No, Lord, this is not going to happen. Okay, so you get this, that you are one of the firstborn among many of the brothers and sisters. And those God predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. That sounds great, doesn't it? Until you remember what it said in verse 1 about being glorified. Yeah. <laughs> right? You got that, right? It doesn't necessarily mean winning the Super Bowl. Exactly. Okay, just as long as you get that. Because the disciples, in the end, didn't end up winning the Super Bowl. But they were glorified. And believe me, that makes a huge difference in eternity. Continuing on, I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. There it is. So that they may be one as we are one. He is saying that we can have the same relationship with the Father that he had. We can pray the way he did. He didn't pray with his head down and every eye closed and every head bowed. He looked into heavens because he said, I'm looking at you face to face when I pray. But remember, this is a special group. Is it you? Yes, it is. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them. Safe by that name you gave me, none has been lost except for the one doomed to destruction. None has been lost. What does that mean? That means that they didn't depart from him. And none of you will be lost because you were given by the Father. Now, I look and I say, Lord, I have no idea why. My parents certainly weren't saved. They were finally at the end, but certainly not any time while I was growing up. You know, I was saved in my 30s, certainly not through the family or any other way. God just reached out. My brother, who's older than me, still not saved. I have no idea why. I don't think we know why. Some of you may, but maybe you don't. But you better be thankful that he has chosen you. And he is able to keep you. And he will keep you, or you wouldn't be here. I firmly believe that. That's who I'm talking to here. So we made it back through verse 12. So I am going to go for verse 13, if you're with me. Yes. We're going to go for a whole new verse. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's go. He said, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still with you in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Once again, he's not talking to everybody. But there's a joy associated with your position. And I don't think we understand that. So we're going to take just a couple of minutes to try to grasp the joy that we should be living in. Apparently it's important because Jesus mentioned it to his disciples, not only there, but also in the two chapters beforehand. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as, they, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. So what he's saying here is that 
if you're submitting to the will of the Father, that you are to have a joy that the world does not have, that He has a joy, and that you should share in His joy. Remember, He says, I'm going to the Father. I want this group of people to have everything on this earth that I had. I have their, my authority, my character. They want, they're going to do the same thing I did. They're going to show the world who the Father is. And they're also going to have joy. In 16, he said, In that day you'll no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Did the Father give Jesus whatever he asked? Yes. So what's going to happen for you? He's going to give you what you ask. This is a hard thing to grasp. But notice it says, in my name. So what does that represent? The authority and the character of. That means you're manifesting who he is. That means if you're a police officer and you call for backup, you can count on the fact that it's coming. Because you're representing him, you're in his effort, and you're doing what he called you to do. Now, I can't necessarily say if you're a police officer and you call dispatch and tell them to send you a cheeseburger, I can't guarantee that. But I can guarantee that if you're doing what he told you to do, that he will give you what you need to do it. And I believe he's saying that here. He says, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name, but ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. So there's a joy associated with this. And, and I'm not sure that I grasp this. So I said, Lord, I'm still trying to understand this joy thing. So we're going to look at it. The word joy, it's an emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. So do we have anything exceptionally good or satisfying here? Yes. Supernatural, it's fun. It is. But I think about it also because I can go to a football game and I'm sitting there looking down on the field watching my team and if they are looking pretty bad, I get sad. But boy, they score a big touchdown and all of a sudden I'm rejoicing with them. Something good has happened. My life still hasn't changed at all. Nothing changed in my life, but all of a sudden I got joy. So I realized that, wait a minute, this joy is a perception based upon a situation and relating to it. So if we're relating to the fact that Jesus Christ scored the ultimate touchdown, if we understood the situation, we would truly be rejoicing. It says, a source or cause of keen pleasure or delight, the expression or display of a glad feeling. Joy. It's relative to a situation. It's relative to something else. Ours is relative to Christ. Yes. The word rejoice is to be glad or take delight, often followed by in. You know, there's a lot of words that we talk about that actually require an object, right? Like um, rejoice. Rejoice in something, in general, is the way it works. Faith. Faith requires an object, doesn't it? I have faith. And what would be your question? Faith in what? In what? Exactly. <laughs> sure, you got faith. You got faith in something. Peter had faith in the storm when he sunk. Uh, but you have faith in something. So there's an object to it. So this is my understanding, as best I can come up with, of joy. So bear with me. Okay, this is my diagram of joy. So I've diagrammed this. So let's see if uh, this makes any sense at all to you guys. This is you right here. Your joy is about this level, and you're sitting there in the world. Now, one of two things happens, or there's two people. One of them goes this way. The other one gets saved. And when you get saved, do you think your joy increases? Sure, yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden now your joy is up here. But notice I added sanctification to it. Because I believe as you go through the sanctification process, your joy increases. Because you get freer of the things of this world. That's right. And so you begin to go through this process and your joy actually rises up here in Christ. So here you are now and you may not realize it. You may think, I don't have joy. Have you ever maybe 
been listening, um, maybe secular radio comes on and they play an old song from back in your BC days. You ever had that happen? Have you ever had that feeling come over you? Or maybe you're in a, sit a place or where you were back in the old BC days and you've had that feeling come over you or you meet somebody from those days and you get that feeling. How's that feel? You don't realize it, but it feels pretty lousy. There was a reason you got saved. Exactly. You got saved because you were down here. Right. You didn't, it's, if you were up here, you wouldn't have got saved. You don't get saved by a continuous, increasing revelation of how good God is. That's just not the way it works. You get saved because you're miserable. You get saved because you realize you need a Savior. So now, you're up here. So let's follow these two lines here. You're in here in the world, and all of a sudden, ah, there's sins of the flesh out there. I can go and do these things. And so you go and do them, and wow, what a rush. Right? It lifts you up. We don't know. Your, your football team scores, and all of a sudden, or you go out and you have a one night with somebody, and some great, oh, wow, this is wonderful. And you get a little kick here because you get to share it with everybody and all that. But then, what happens? Zoom. And usually, you have what I call overshoot, being an engineer. Uh, overshoot means that not only do you continue to drop, but you drop so far that you actually go below where you were. And you have to sort of come back up. So, the sins of the flesh are up here, and you rise up to grab hold of them, and then, boom, you get it, and then all of a sudden, bam, you're back to here. But if you're saved, you look at the same, and it may be just as good for you as it was for them. But what's the difference? It's down from your joy. You go and do these things, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, this isn't as fun as it used to be. Yeah, that's true. That is so true. You know, it is. You just don't realize that it's a step down from where you were. Your joy really did come up. You really are up here. You just don't know it. You don't realize it. Yes, you have miserable and tough things happen, but there is a joy of the Lord. And as you get sanctified, you will find out that your joy gets greater and sin has less and less appeal to you. Even if the thought comes and tries to talk you into it, you may actually go try it and find out, eh, it just isn't the same. It, it's you that's not the same. So I believe that he does increase your joy. And I believe as you're sanctified, it gets greater and greater. It does. It does. I noticed I put this, that once you do the sin, it seems to come up pretty slowly from there, back to your normal joy. Because you got to deal with this thing. And you, and it, it, you just don't usually pop right back up. That's right. It's like, oh boy, this was really bad. And this, you sh oh, I did that. And oh my gosh. Exactly. But you do get back up there. And you will get back up there. The events of life. This is my other diagram. The same situation. Here you are in Christ and here you are in the world. You're looking for positive events in life to try to get you up a little higher, right? You know, you're going to score good on your test. Your football team's going to win. You're going to do this. So, something is important to you to get you up a little bit. So you're always looking for that, that little bitty high that you get. You know, the pat on the back. You need that stuff to get through the day. You've got to keep busy. You've got to keep that energy going because you're down here and you need that to keep you pumped up. And, of course, if it just happens to let go, yep, you drop back down, and you've got to go find something else. So you're always out there trying to keep busy because you're afraid that moment when silence hits, you're going to sink like a rock. Because once there's no stimulation, boom, you're back there. But in Christ, you're buoyant. You know what the term buoyant means? If you take, a, if you take a, a, a beach ball and you were able to get it under the water, what happens when you let go of it? Pops out. That's right. So you're either 
like lead and you sink unless you got something propping you up or you're buoyant. Meaning, yeah, you can be held down, but just as soon as you, the oppression leaves, right. boom, you're back up. That's right. that's good. And I believe that's what happens here. There are negative events in life, and very often they're what's called cascading. You've noticed that. One thing, then another thing, then another thing, and it's attempting to bring you down. But the fact is, you are not going to turn from Christ. And if you don't turn from Christ, boom, you're going to come back up as soon as it's gone. You know how much energy it takes to keep you down? Half the, half the kingdom, the devil's kingdom, is out there trying to keep you oppressed. But they can't do anything to you. They could keep you down for a while. But even if you died, yeah, I mean, do you get what's... I mean, because now not only do you, do you die through the oppression, but the oppression gives you an eternal weight and glory. So they're not doing... They actually can't get you. And it takes a whole lot of energy to keep you down. And eventually, if every time you get down, you start praying for somebody else, you know what to do. You just basically say, wait a minute. If they're going to attack me, then I'm going to attack them. They, they wake you up in the middle of the night, fine, I'm going to pray in tongues and pray for somebody. And pretty soon they don't wake you up in the middle of the night as much. That's true. So we've got to learn that we are buoyant and how we can make it cost them a whole lot of energy to keep you down. Now these guys are looking for every kind of energy they can to keep you up like a drug addict. They're, they're addicts. they got to shoot up with something. Yeah. But we need to be up here. We have a joy of our salvation. So that's my understanding of the joy that's in us. That it was real. It's not just something, well, I'm waiting for that joy to appear. No, I think we actually have it. And I think that if you realize, we should be very grateful to the Lord. Amen. He's chosen us, and He has given us joy. You know, I know Catherine over there. She's, I mean, you talk about somebody I know personally who's been through this. And here she is. And I don't know about you, but every now and then I see a real smile on her face. And I'm telling you, if, if you know her, you know that this has been really tough. That's right. <laughs> Kim's been going through. I mean, it's tough. But then again, you see the smile on her face. Because eventually it's going to end or she's going to die. And guess what? That's Either way you win. You say, well, Lord, come and rapture me. But I got to tell you, there's really not a lot of difference between the rapture and dying. If you want to get raptured before all this happens, no problem. Just die. I'm not sure there's any difference. Right? I mean, I don't know what the difference is. Except, you know, maybe when you rapture, you have that blink of an eye that's different. But outside of that, the dead in Christ rise first. So you even beat them. So I don't, I don't. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, but there shouldn't be anybody left to pick them up. So you shouldn't worry about it. So I got a word, enjoy. And just happened to have it a week ago, and I didn't know that's what I was going to do. But it says, Today I give you my joy. For my joy is of the kingdom, which now is, and yet is coming soon. My joy is for your eternal blessing that cannot be taken from you. My joy is for your eternal destiny by my side. My joy is for your glorified body and your glorified life with me. Therefore, if you abide in me then you will abide in my joy. Now, I got this a week ago before I knew I was even going to talk about this. I didn't understand it then. Not sure I got it now. Yes, there is suffering and mourning in this world, and there is a season for everything. Suffering, suffering and mourning will come to pass, but your joy in the kingdom has come to stay. Great victories in this world are going to come to pass, but your victory in the kingdom has come to stay. Today I give you my joy. Receive it and rejoice in your destiny with me. 
joy.